Welcome into the New Orleans Saints podcast. You'll hear from players, coaches, broadcasters, and writers that cover the NFL on a daily basis. The New Orleans Saints podcast starts right now. Here's your host, Aaron Summers. Welcome into the New Orleans Saints podcast. The Saints preseason is officially over. They wrap things up in the season, or Superdome Sunday against the Houston Texans. Fortunately, ending in a loss, but they do go 2-1 on the preseason, which is a first winning record for the Saints since 2018 in preseason play. So overall, not too bad. Saw a lot of good stuff happening across training camp. And to help break it all down, we have our Saints senior writer, John DeShazer and voice of the saints mike haas thank you so much guys for joining me i guess i'll just get your first initial take on sunday's game anything that really stood out to you john well i jimmy graham looked like you know some flashes of the old jimmy graham so you know obviously that bodes well for the saints because you know that's a guy who can play in the red zone i don't know if he can give you you know 40 50 snaps a game and be the jimmy graham that you know we are accustomed to seeing but if he can play that role that he played on Sunday, then he's going to be really effective. And and I know the Saints were two and one in the preseason, but really, you know, they were kind of undefeated from the standpoint of, you know, no major injuries. And that's always what you want to get out of the preseason with. If you can get out of it, out of it with, you know, everybody standing, uh, that, that's a major accomplishment for any team. So they were able to do that, uh, with the exception of you know a couple of nicks and bruises here and there, but for the most part, nothing major. Yeah, for me, pretty much the same. I mean, it was it was tough to really gauge last night because Houston played a lot more starters uh, offensively and defensively, certainly with C.J. Stroud, and you would expect their offensive line. I did expect that. But defensively, I thought that was a big test for the Saints' backups um, because de- defensively, Houston kind of kept their guys in, and you could see the pressure uh, that Jameis was facing. It's so hard to really put any kind of barometer on 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 preseason play I, I like John you look at kind of individual efforts I really have felt like Brian Brzee has kind of grown exponentially I was thinking the other day you know typically when you have a number one pick that guy is the focus from the minute camp begins until you know every day you don't care who you're talking to you're asking about the number one pick and, and it wasn't like that this year. I mean, it was rare for us to talk about Brian Brzee. Like, how did he do today? How did he do today? How did he do? And so he was able to kind of just grow and like the play he made against the Chargers and the spin move that he made last night. Like when you have another defensive lineman, a veteran, Malcolm, like a talk about a move that you made as a rookie, that's that was kind of – uh, impressive. So, uh, there was a lot of good things. I think Isaac uh, Yedem has been a pleasant surprise. Uh, this is going to be a difficult cut because I think there will be guys on these on these on these that get cut that will make other rosters, which just shows you that this training camp had far more quality talent than they've had in the past, and that's what you want. Absolutely. Head coach Dennis Allen said at the beginning of camp that they set this roster up for a training camp to be very competitive. And that's what they expected throughout camp to have a lot of battles that came down to the wire. I think there are a few that became more of a competition than we probably thought they were going to be throughout camp. And then some players who definitely solidified their spots as training camp went on. We talked about from the very beginning, there was going to be a battle at corner. I think we may know who is going to be your starting corner. Uh, I know JD weighed in on this, but you have a, a final say now that the last game is done. Yeah, we know, we know. And, and they know, because I mean, and I don't want to say he, you know, but Delonte Taylor kind of, you know, gave us a, a giveaway uh, the last time he spoke to us where he was basically saying, look, I, I'm not worried about being a starter. I just want to make sure I'm on the field. Um, he had not played particularly well in the slot and that's where they really want him to to kind of flourish because he is one of the better cornerbacks on this team. And he is, a, a, he's got a great future ahead of him in order for him to get on the field consistently. It'll probably have to be at the slot unless he's waiting on somebody to get injured. And unfortunately, you know, that hadn't happened because he was not able to beat out Paulson Adebo. I think, I think Paulson Adebo probably, you know, last year, 
he probably was the defensive MVP of training camp. Mm -hmm. And this year, he wasn't quite that, but he you can see he's kind of back to being, you know, somewhat in the per, in the periphery of what we expect him to be. And it was difficult for Elante to beat him out. So, you know, that's one of those where hopefully Elante can adjust to the slot because that's probably where he's going to be for the most part, uh, unless, you know, unless Adebo gets injured or unless, you know, Marshawn Lattimore gets injured, he's going to make his bones at the slot. And right now, Bradley Roby might be a little bit more adept at it because Bradley Roby's played it more, but, you know, he, he's got the talent to do it. So now it's whether or not he can, he can kind of mentally lock in and be able to do it. And that's what the, that's what the coaching staff is, is hoping for. Sure. It's definitely going to be a challenge for him. And he's spoken about that, how he has to give himself more grace as he's trying to learn that position a little bit better. Looking at the linebacker competition, it was who's going to be the third after Demario Davis and Pete Werner. They brought in Jalen Smith. I mean, Mike, where do you think we stand in, in that? Ooh, that's tough. Uh, I think I, I, it might be more of a mix. I know the team liked and has liked uh, Nephi Sewell and what they've seen of him maybe as that three, but because of what he brings uh, from a special teams standpoint, DeMarco Jack. I mean, it was just – you could you could make an argument for DeMarco. You could make an argument for Zach. Uh, I think overall, you know, they play so much too. It's not really a function or a question unless something happens – uh, to, to Pete or or Demario, but I, I looked at that position. So if they, you know, if they keep five, um, you know, it's a it's really just a question of you know Demarco and, and and Nephi, and I think they're both going to find a way whether practice squad or the roster to be on. Uh, but it was, I've seen a, a different Zach Bond. You talk about competition at camp and how things change. I feel like I've seen a different Zach Bond. Uh, this camp, I think the, the competition with Will Lutz, you know, uh, when you don't have anybody to kick against every day, and training camp must just be, you know, you know what you do. You just sit around talking to Zach Wood all day. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that that competition at linebacker has made that position so much better, uh, just over overall. So again, I don't know who it'll be, but I, I feel like Nephi Sewell is is, is in that conversation. You brought up the kicking competition and JD had something you've said. No one thinks a kicking competition, a punting competition is sexy. How do you feel about it today after the third preseason game? I mean, we saw a lot from, from everybody involved. I, I, I just don't feel good about it. Um, I guess if I had to, if I had to pick one of the two, I'd, I'd probably go with Blake Gilligan because he's done it in NFL games before. And so you, you kind of get a feel for what you think he is. And yet he's been somewhat inconsistent. He was inconsistent last season. Uh, he's been inconsistent in training camp and he's been in, inconsistent somewhat in these preseason games. And so, you know, he just, I don't feel great about it. I mean, you know, with the kickers, I, I kind of feel, I won't say great about Will Lutz, but it, it feels like Will Lutz, whatever it was that was hampering him last year. And he said he was over the, the physical part, but he said he had a little bit of a mental block. And with these kickers, I mean, we all know if, if if they've got something going on mentally, then it can just be, you know, out the window. It can go sideways really quick. But he seems like he's gotten over that. And I know Blake Groupie really pushed him. But again, when you're in that situation, you know, do you go with an untested guy in NFL games or do you go with a guy who's won literally NFL games? And so for that one, I feel a little bit better. But but the punter situation, I, I never got a good feel for Blake Gillikin just kind of taking that job and, and you know you bring in competition as, as Mike said you know you bring in competition usually it kind of raises the stakes I think I think Will Lutz had a really good camp I think Blake Groupie had a really good camp at kicker um, but the punters I don't know if either one of those guys you can look at and say man he just separated himself from the other guy it, it felt like you know what both of those guys were like you know well I'll leave the door open here you go come on in if you want to and it just it just I, I still don't have a great feel for it you know it wouldn't it wouldn't shock me if the the punter wasn't in the building right now. It wouldn't shock me. But I but I think if I had to pick one of those guys, I think it'd be Blake Gilligan. Okay. So what position are you watching at, when the final roster comes out? Like which one are you looking at first to see who lands where and who's kept or not? 
I'm kind of looking at receiver because I mean, you look at the back end, you know who the you know who the front guys are. You know, Chris mm-hmm. Olave and Mike Thomas and, and Rashid Shahid. And and I kind of feel like I kind of feel like Keith Kirkwood has kind of earned the spot. You know, he does some things on special teams and he's played pretty well. So if they're only going to have five receivers, you know, between you know AT Perry and Shaq Davis, you know, who's the who's gonna win the coin flip there and who do you feel really good about? And you you can't forget about Traquan Smith because these guys, you know, the coaching staff, I don't care what fans say, the coaching staff values him. Uh, they like the things that he does when he's healthy. And so you can't overstate that. They have film on Traquan Smith and how he can help a team as opposed to the rookies. And so you you can't just discount him. And yet, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the back end of the, of the receiver spot. And, you know, Mike mentioned the, the linebackers. I feel pretty solid about Jalen Smith. I, I, I thought Zach Bond had a great opportunity to just kind of take that thing and, and put his hands around it and lock it up. And then when they put in a call to Jalen Smith, it's like, Mm, that that might not bode well for the guys who are here that they're still looking. And then Jalen Smith comes in and plays pretty well. And so I think he's, you know, I think he's really in the mix because you know, Jalen Smith has, has, he told us point blank, look, I've never played special teams in my life. You know, he's, he's never done it. So, you know, he's going to be a guy who, who's going to be a regular. And if you're going to keep him now, the other guys are going to have to be, you know, we know Zach Bond's a really good special teamer. Can Nephi Seal do that also? You know, can DeMarco Jackson do that also? Because that's where they're going to have to kind of stick. Sure. You mentioned Traquan Smith. We did see him for the first time on the sideline in street clothes, was not dressed out, but good to see him back after he's been dealing with that injury since August 6th, when he went out early with the groin injury at practice. Mike, if you look at the roster and position groups, you know, JD kind of went through the wide receiver. Is anybody that stood out to you and kind of claimed a spot there? No, the wide re- to me, when you get to this point of the, of the of the situation, now again, we've never been in this situation because this is the first year where they've kept all 90 mm. to this point. But I, I, I agree with John. To me, it's that receiver group, and it really becomes a chess match with Mickey and 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 guys because like you can put veterans you know, on the practice squad where you might be a little worried about Shaq Davis and A.T. Perry making it through. Maybe you put a veteran there who can still sign with other teams, but this, the same situation is probably their best bet. So I think that's what you kind of see at this point, like, because I'm interested to see how they handle the A.T. Perry, Shaq Davis uh, situation, because they've shown such kind of raw bits of talent. Um, but yet, and so do you, do you take a chance uh putting them putting them out there whereas you might be able to put a put a Kirkwood and a Traquan you know on, on the practice squad and, and maybe they don't get signed. It's up to it's up to them. Uh, I'm I've I've just been impressed with with Kendra Miller from, from the get-go, Jamal Williams from the get-go. You know, there's two aspects, you know, with Alvin and Marcus May, they won't count against your roster. So you got kind of I wouldn't say it's an advantage because you'd rather have Alvin and Marcus May. Uh, but it will be interesting to see how um, how it does break down and, and who they're who they think can get through waivers and who they think can't because you don't want to make a you get one shot at that you mm-hmm. don't want to make a mistake there and and I've seen a lot of really good young talent John John's right and about with Jalen Smith and here's what I here, he hasn't played special teams but from what I've seen especially yesterday. Man, he, I feel like that dude would flourish on special teams. Running in and out and hitting people. I mean, yeah, I feel like that's all he cares about doing is hitting people. I think, I bet they maybe if he gives it a shot, I think he'll find out that he loves special teams. I could be wrong, but just, man, he loves laying the wood like anybody I've never seen. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. But he, he, that would be an inter- interesting situation with him on special teams. You mentioned a few of the rookies, kind of going back to yesterday's game against the Texans. I think we really saw, yes, Brian Brzee take a step forward, but Isaiah Foskey seems like he's finally catching up to what he's been asked to do here, the speed of the game. Lucas Kroll, not a rookie, but somebody who didn't play last season, he stood out in the game yesterday. Jake Hayner looks like he's going to have some up and downs as to be expected with a rookie. I, I think he his spot is going to be safe here. It's, it's going to be a project for the next year or so. How about some of the younger guys on the team that maybe stood out in yesterday's game for you guys? Jake Hayner's got one of the best jobs in the league. I mean, he's, he's <laughs> solidified as the number three quarterback, so he can just kind of let it all hang out. 
and, you know, play through his mistakes um, because, you know, the expectations aren't there that he will have to play. So he can just kind of let it all hang out. Uh, Brian Brzee showed some stuff, you know, throughout the, throughout training camp, really, he, he showed some stuff. And, and when you've got guys like Malcolm Roach saying, look, he's just so good that all we want him to do is not necessarily worry about fundamentals, just go and wreak havoc, however it is you wreak havoc. And so you understand his natural ability. I think Isaiah Foskey really, really needed to, to play well, to kind of, you know, for himself, you know, as much as for the team, for his own psyche to show, you know, I, I belong here because there were some stints where you kind of looked at him, you were like, you know what, this is, this, this might take a, this might take a while. And in the last couple of games or weeks, you look at him, you say, okay, he, he's figuring it out. He's kind of understanding a little bit better. Um, and, and he's, able to get in and make some plays in the process. So, you know, I, I really felt good just for him to see him go out and make some plays because, I, you know, you're a rookie, you, you've been dominating in college, you come in and, and things aren't quite the same. You know, it's a little bit faster, guys are bigger, stronger, and maybe you can get a little bit down on yourself, but, you know, it looks like he's played through it and kind of kind of gotten his feet up under him. And, you know, he might be a healthy scratch for some games, but I, I got a feeling that somewhere down the stretch, you know, with his development, he's going to make some plays, hopefully in this season, where he's yeah. going to help us. Say, you know, you spend a second round pick on the guy, you expect him to be able to help you that season because now second round picks are starters in the NFL. You know, you draft guys that high, you expect them to come in and play. And so he's going to have to contribute. I know he's, you know, hopefully he's going to be able to do that because it looks like he's kind of picked up his pace a little bit. Yeah. And Mike, I know I'm going to, I said something about yesterday's game, but Trevor Penning didn't play in it, but he's somebody I definitely want to touch yeah. on as well. And the offensive line overall. Yeah, that was, um, you know, he, he played, he was the only guy that did start in the chargers game. He had the two practices with the chargers. And so I think he would have liked to have seen uh, him out there just more reps, but you know, I, I can understand I can understand the Saints argument why he didn't because of the Chargers game and he was the only guy in the dip. And yeah, to me, that's, you know, that left side, man, there are times in those Chargers practices where that left side and, and if you assume that James Hurst is going to be your left guard and, and Trevor's out there and that's, that's Derek Carr's backside, right? That's his blind side. That, that those guys, I, I don't feel great right now. I mean, I could be, you know, preseason is not the greatest barometer, but I don't feel great because I feel like Trevor has some has some room to to grow. He gets beat. He kind of gets beat on that fake outside move and then move to the inside. And, and man, that's unless you got you don't want to have to spend capital with somebody that has to stay back and chip. Uh, you know, chip chip that guy have a have a back stay back and, and chip on that on that left side. So I think you're right. That that area is, you know, it's the kind of elephant in the room, um, and hopefully they've seen enough out of him and, and practice and, and, and where he can grow and, and you, know, you get everybody else. And I think he can get there. I just feel like right now, I I, I don't know that he is Nick Saldivar. He's another one. You know, if you look at just look at the rookies and he's more of a project, he's going to be down the road a little bit. Jordan Howden, I felt like kind of really turned it up the last couple of games. And he is definitely to, in my mind, I mean, if he makes it the 53 or is he, if he's active, can be a really dominant special teams guy because they're still, you know, they use Ugo and they use different guys on you know, opposite JT, uh, Alante. So it just, you know, there, there, there are, I've been pretty much impressed overall with this draft group, uh, you know, top to bottom, AT Perry, even at seven um, has come, made, made some significant play. So, but you're right. Uh, the, the the Trevor Penning situation. Hopefully, we're not talking about it in week two and three and four because he's kind of solidified it. But it's he's still has to be proven. He would say he, that. He, Coach would say I, that. I, yeah, I think he's got to be. You know, he's got the he's got the mauler part. You, mm -hmm. you know, he'll he'll maul you. He'll he'll beat you up. You know, so he's got to kind of get the the ballet feet for the past for the past pro pro because that's where he's, you know, had a little bit of difficulty. You know, once he gets his hands on you, it's pretty much over. But, you know, now the problem is when you're dealing with those speed rushers and those guys with those counter moves, you know, getting your hands on them because they make it difficult for you. They they ain't just out there to just bull rush you and allow you to have your way with them. Um, they can they can do some things. So that's where he's, you know, hopefully gotten his biggest jump because he, he as, as Mike said, you know, you, you're protecting Derek Carr's back, you know, backside. That's, that's your franchise quarterback. So 
you got to have somebody over there that, that you trust. I don't really want to go into, you mentioned, you know, Derek Carr and, and we know he's going to make the roster and how much he's changed this team. We've been talking about it all training camp. So let's kind of go with two things that happened in the game last night that were throwbacks, the beginning of the game where you have Deuce McAllister, you have Mark Ingram and Alvin Kamara come out in the three different numbers that Mark Ingram wore. I mean, that was such a cool moment. That was a really fun way to pay tribute to him since Mark Ingram was in the house. I know, J.D., you were fired up about it. Yeah, well, Mark's, you know, deuces, that's my dude. So, uh, you know, now, and it, and it was a, a, a good quirk that he wore three numbers and they had his three numbers on. And you kind of wondered, okay, which one of these is Mark going to wear? But, he, you know, he always goes with the double deuces. But, yeah, it was it was real cool to have, you know, kind of a tribute, you know, past and, and, and future. You know, you had Deuce, you had Mark, uh, you had you had Alvin. And I, for my money, you know, and no disrespect to Dalton Hill, you're the three best running backs in franchise history. You know, you look at the production and those guys are at the top of the list. And so, to you know, be able to bring them together and go out and do the Houdat chant, you know, was a really nice moment for all of them. And Mike, we mentioned Jimmy yeah. Graham, but the the vintage Jimmy Graham was back, and man, the crowd loved it. Man, I, you're right. I was because it, we, if you look at the passes, I mean, they they weren't great, they weren't bad, they weren't, you know, they were just kind of there. And Deuce and I said, I said to Deuce, I was like, I know one guy on the sidelines right now is going. Oh baby, and that's Derek Carr, because he that's a that's a throw that he likes to make, and now he's got a guy and the Jimmy Graham, and he, you know he, he likes it with, with with Foster as well, but we haven't really seen a ton of. But it was just man contested catches, right? We we saw it with Mike Thomas this camp. We actually saw it with Lucas Kroll. You know everything that that we wanted to all, most of the questions that we wanted to answer this training camp: contested catches, forcing turnovers. You know, uh, really, other than than last night, this defense did a great job by forcing turnovers, making the catches that you should make. Um, so, yeah, that was just – it was fun. It was fun to see Jimmy Graham make those. I mean, I don't think we've said the word seam route <laughs> since 2020 uh, when Drew left. And it, it used to be – and back shoulder. We didn't we, – we used to say seam route and back shoulder every other play. And from 2020 back to 06, and now it it it, it feels like it's back, and that, and that's that's a cool thing. I will say on the Deuce thing, I thought it was awesome, except for the part when Deuce came to the booth and went, "Hey, look, I'm gonna be leaving for about 10 minutes, going down <laughs> to the field, so you handle the broadcast." I went, "What? You go? What? You're doing what?" <laughs> he goes, "It's a surprise. We can't say anything." I said, "You're doing what?" <laughs> I was <laughs> wondering about that. Post- in typical ghost fashion, we call Deuce because he just appears out of nowhere. He, he, I was looking down on the field, and they'd finished, and I came back up, and he was sitting there. I was like, "Oh, come on!" Uh, <laughs> no, that was that was really cool. I mean, those guys have amassed like seventeen thousand yards uh, for this football team, and you know, all all good people. As we look back on training camp, you alluded to some things that we wanted to see with the takeaways, the contested catches, the health that we've been watching, JD. What about training camp has you feeling good going into the regular season? Yeah, I, I feel pretty good about the defense. I think this defense is going to force more turnovers. Um, they've been real cognizant about it. And, you know, even in practice, you know, they're just reaching and scra- scratching and pawing at the ball all the time. And that's the way you get turnovers. You got you to gotta be really mindful of it, even in the middle of everything that's going on in the chaos. You got to be going after the football. And so I think they they understand from last season where they didn't do that a whole lot, and this team really needed for them to do it. I don't necessarily know if they'll need them to do it as much as they needed them to do it last season because you know Derek Carr is an upgrade, and if you got you know if, if Mike Thomas and Jimmy Graham are going to be somewhat healthy and they're going to be on the field, that's a distinct advantage offensively. And then you know, that takes so much pressure off of Chris Olave, and you know now you don't need Rashid Shahid to make a huge jump, but you do need them to improve some. So I think if the defense can do that, I, I, th- I just think that's going to be really, really big for this team. And it looks like they have the mindset of get the ball, get the ball, get the ball. And, and plus, and two, they need to be able to stop the run because if you can't stop the run, you can't stop anything on defense. And it got to a point last year where they had problems with that. And when they had problems with that, they couldn't get off the field. 
And so they got to be able to stop the run in the early downs, obviously. But I think they really have put the emphasis on on the takeaways, and I think it's taken. Yeah, Mike, what are you looking forward to seeing once the, the Tennessee Titans are here, 12 o'clock, September 10th? Yeah. Well, that offense, I mean, and, and I will say John is 100% correct. We we focus sometimes on uh, the Saints' defensive ability to stop the pass when they were number two in the league. Well, that's because teams ran it for 130 yards a game. If you don't stop the run, we saw it some last night. Now, bad, you know, preseason is not the way you want to go. But man, if you can't clog that middle and stop the run, and I think Saunders and Shepard were great pickups from a free agent standpoint. So that, to me, defensively, if you can't stop the run, get turnovers, That'll be different. But this offense, Derek Carr, Rashid Shahid, possibly Jimmy Graham, Mike Thomas, Chris Olave, I mean, uh, Jamal Williams, I, you know, I'm I, I'm excited to see, and I feel like Derek Carr can be the kind of quarterback that this franchise has needed since Drew. There's never going to be another Drew, but you needed somebody with that mindset who has the physical and mental acumen to, to do what Pete Carmichael wants to do, because it's, as I've said to Pete and to Derek, it's not a nicety to be able to walk to this line and have three or four plays in your head and pull out of the correct ones. It's a necessity uh, for success. And I think he's got that. I'm, I'm, I'm just looking forward to seeing all of it put together into one bundle. Yeah. It was really fun when we got to see the ones go in that first game. And, and I think one of the things we saw with Derek is he 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 can throw guys open. I don't this, I don't think he'll have to have to win a whole bunch of games. It, it, the NFL is a quarterback league now, and you know you need an outstanding guy. But I think he can make the throw on third and seven when you're trying to run the clock out to get you out of the game, and that's going to be big for this team because you know they're in a lot of situations where you just need that four minute drill at the end to finish it out. I think he's a guy who can who can make that throw to finish it out. He's definitely going to change this offense immensely, and it'll take pressure off of the defense and vice versa. He said he's been looking forward to playing with a defense that is as good as the Saints defense has been historically. So it's going to be a lot of fun. I mean, I'm glad preseason football is over. We had to cap it off for everybody wow. last night. <laughs> and it all starts for a 90 I'm so I'm so done of 180 people if <laughs> I have to see another roster with 180 people I will it, it's but but I will say this in closing they're never going back that I know the, the franchises and the organizations it cost them more money I get it it's not necessarily great for the administration from a coaching standpoint from a preseason standpoint that I mean you get you get a full body of work you don't have to – imagine they'd only had 80 players last night. So you didn't have to play, you didn't have to play more guys than you wanted mm-hmm. to play. I mean, it's one of those things. I don't think they're ever going back from that. Yeah. No, they won't. But, but the only – I mean, the only thing I love about preseason is the joint practices. That's the only thing I love about the preseason because that is a preseason game. Uh, you get a lot more productive work in those than you do, I think. In the game that you, of right. course, it's the fight for roster spots and they want to flash and, you know, make a play. But, you know, the joint practices are what kind of keeps me juiced up about preseason because otherwise, man, I'm, I'm just kind of counting days on my fingers and marking them off on the calendar on the wall, scratching them off, saying, okay, can we just get to this date so we can be done with these? Yeah. Well, we got some good joint practices against the Chargers this year. A lot of fun. And I think both teams, you know, really showed some stuff there. So it'll be interesting to kind of follow their season as well, knowing how we played against them. Next week, we will start regular season. It will be game week. Practices mean more. We'll have a final 53 roster in the next couple of days. A couple of things may change once the waivers go through. But by the end of the week, We should know who our team is, at least to start the season. So it's all really exciting. John, thank you so much. Mike, appreciate you. I know you're extremely busy right now, but thankfully you don't have to prepare for 180 players each week anymore. (laughs) Yay, yay, yay. Thank you so much, guys. Great seeing you. Yep. Thanks for listening to the New Orleans Saints podcast. Join us three times per week on NewOrleansSaints.com, the Saints mobile app, or you can download the podcast on iTunes. We'll see you next time right here on the New Orleans Saints podcast.